session um, um, with for a primary care education session. I am delighted to be joined by um, Jess Webb, consultant cardiologist at GSTT, Andrew De Silva, De Silva cardiologist at GSTT, and Dan Sado, cardiologist at um, consultant cardiologist at Kings, will be joining us a little bit later. Um, but yes, I first would like to say thank you all for joining us at what is an incredibly busy time, um, and particularly for the speakers who have also prepared talks for us this afternoon. Um, Jess will be talking about the identification, referral and management of heart failure. Um, Andy will then be covering the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure. And then Dan will be doing a session on the interpretation of ECGs. And we'll be doing a question and answer session at the end of each of the speakers' um, time slots. So please um, do put your comment or your questions into the chat or wait to the end of the session and we'll pick up the questions then. Uh, we are recording the session and that will be then be available for either yourself or your colleagues um, on the South London Cardiovascular Network's website and we'll be sending you those details along with CPD certificates after the session. Um, if you can all put your um, cameras on, um, um, on, on, on off and put your mics on mute that would be really appreciated and um, I think without further ado I will hand over to you Jess thank you very much hi there um, I hope everyone can hear me um, please put something on the chat if you can't um, thank you everyone for logging in um, two weeks before Christmas um, it's very kind of you. I've done a few slides. Um, I very much feel like I'm the warm up for the STLT2 inhibitors and the ECG. And I have some slides, but I think Andrea may be sharing them. Or if not, yeah. I can yeah. share them myself. Just them Perfect. Um, apologies, because it's going to be lots of next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, these are my slides. slides. So we've got a bit of a whistle stop tour um, for heart failure. And I wanted to talk about what kind of matters to heart failure in, in the community and for GPs. Um, and the reason this is so important is because we've had some new ESE guideline updates, which has slightly changed how we look after patients. But central to this, obviously, is early and accurate diagnosis ensuring patients get access to the care that they need and ensuring that they get on the right medical therapies, which are the cornerstone of treatment. And so the plan for this session, which is the next slide, please, is really to talk about referrals, the new guidelines and the key messages. So next slide. Thank you. Um, the nomenclature of heart failure is kind of relevant, I think, for all of us in terms of patients who have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. That is an ejection fraction of under 40 percent. An ejection fraction is a marker of how well the left ventricle, the pumping chamber pumps. And if the left ventricle function is down and under 40 percent, these patients feel better, live longer and have reduced hospitalizations which is important not only for patients, but you know, obviously healthcare as well. So patients who have HEFRA, we call it heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HEFRA, uh, need to be on guideline-directed therapy or evidence-based therapy. We used to call this mid-range, uh, mid-range heart failure. Now we call it heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And more and more, I think lots of us as clinicians are treating these patients with HEFRA. Patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the heart pump works well, but the pressures in their heart are too high. So they struggle really on exercise, they have multiple comorbidities, and the mainstay of therapy for patients with HEF is diuretics, which is to reduce the volume overload and management of their comorbidities. And then the reason there has been this nomenclature change from mid-range to mildly reduced to really line up with the Americans, the Japanese, 14 different countries, and you know, six continents. Um, next slide, sorry, Andrea. And essentially what you can see, and if you just click it, there'll just be a ring coming up on the right saying that classification of heart failure is now in line across universally across the world. 
So should we go to the next slide, which is a picture which you guys should sound familiar. So apologies if you're showing two right legs, it's a slightly disturbing picture. What you can see is this is pitting edema. So this is a patient who is all too familiar for, with all of us. 76 year old man who comes to you with increasing breathlessness over some time, reduced exercise tolerance and swollen legs. And when you press his legs, you see this lovely indentation of pitting edema. Um, he's an ex-smoker, hypertensive, HPA once he's a little bit raised. He's never had chest pain. He's sleeping with more pillows and he's just tired and unable to do what he was able to do. And blood pressure's okay, heart rate's a little bit high, sats are okay. It's difficult to even get him onto the couch, but you can't convincingly tell us where the JVP is and you can't hear any murmurs. And the important thing here is you know, what to do because this patient needs to be assessed. Can we have the next slide, please? And these are the guidelines that we used. So if you suspect chronic heart failure, as you guys are doing all the time, detailed history, and you measure an NT probe MP, please do not request an echo. And the only reason that we say this is because the waiting time for an echo is approximately six weeks. It'll take a week or two for the echo to come back to you. Um, you'll then have to re-refer it. So really, unfortunately results in a delay of up to three months for these patients and it's quicker to request an NT-Pro BMP um, and then refer us, refer the patient to us. If it's over 2,000 nanograms per mil or picograms per mil, um, they need to be seen within two weeks. We consult and triage every referral. And some of you will have noticed, um, you'll have had emails back from me or my colleague Andy who's speaking next and um, often we comment because it's difficult as you can see in the kind of middle of that slide there are two different reference ranges two different units you can measure NT pro BMP in um, and in that and Sonic we use nanograms per litre or picograms per mil in Bexley they use picomoles per litre and so if you don't add the units in. Sometimes there is a kind of a delay where we have to work out which units you're using and how quickly the patient needs to be seen. So if you can add the units, that's fantastic. And I guess it's just re relevant to think about what NT pro BMP is. So NT pro BMP is a pro hormone um, which is increasing the stretch on the heart or evidence of fluid overload, and it acts on the kidneys resulting in fluid and sodium loss. It's a mild vasodilator, so it reduces the pressure. And so we measure nt pro -BMP because it's a stable biomarker and indicates what's going on. Once we have seen the referral in the ERS, we consult and triage it and we use a one-stop shop clinic. So we try really hard to get an echo on the same day. Sometimes, it's not feasible and we have to bring the patient back. Uh, but we try as hard as we can. Similarly, if patients have had an echo within the last couple of weeks, then we won't necessarily repeat it. Um, if the NT pro BMP is over 2,000, we will see the patient within two weeks. If it's between 400 and 2,000, we aim to see them within six weeks. We audit our data monthly. Um, in truth, during COVID, we actually didn't have that many referrals. Um, but we also didn't have many face-to-face -face appointments. So after the initial COVID surge, we had an awful lot of referrals and we struggled to meet these deadlines and targets. And please bear with us if we're not giving your patients an appointment within the allotted time because we're trying our hardest, I promise. Um, referrals have pretty much stabilised now to pre-COVID or pre-lockdown number one. Um, and we're seeing activities high and we're also trying to fit in all our patients who are existing outpatients. On the right of the screen, you can see if the NT pro BMP is normal, the patient doesn't have heart failure. And so you need to think of another diagnosis um, and see what else you think is going on. Next slide, please. And um, this is really a kind of slide about contacting us. So if it's a new patient, please use ERS. Um, and typically the appointment will be made. Sometimes we ask for more information. 
Uh, if we reject, we normally give, well, we always give information as to why we're rejecting. If the patient's known to the heart failure team, you can either contact the nurse, the pharmacist or the consultant, and this is shared details. If the patient doesn't have heart failure and you think they need to be, you know, if they need to have a cardiology consult, then you can either go through a general referral or go through Consultant Connect um, or try and speak to Consultant of the Week. So we both, both Kings and St Thomas's have Consultant of the Weeks on, um, which is a very useful resource. Next slide. So in 2021, um, in the summer, the European Society of Cardiology updated the heart failure guidelines. And this is a schematic I actually stole from the British Heart Failure Society. Um, and I quite liked it because it was quite simple. And I was trying to think of you know, what's relevant for us and what's relevant for general practice and um, how I could make this relevant to you. And essentially, we talked about the nomenclature already. What you will notice in patients with chronic heart failure is that we are adding in SGLT2 inhibitors earlier and we are prescribing the first three months and then we're asking you to continue that. So we are asking you to continue SGLT2 inhibitors in patients who have heart failure or HEFREF, ejection function under 40% who are not diabetic. You will also notice the patients, which is 0.3 on this schematic, that newly refer um, diagnosed patients will probably go home on a smaller dose of an ACE or an ARNI, uh, which is either Ramaprol or Sucuptral Valsartan, a beta blocker, an MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitors. We are also working very hard to give iron to patients who are iron deplete in uh, patients with HEF-REP. Now, the rest of the slide talks about devices. Um, so there's still a drive to give patients who have HEF-REP, either CRT, which is when you synchronize the left and the right heart, um, with a pacemaker for patients who have left bundle branch block and impaired of function. Um, acute heart failure guidelines have slightly changed, so we're working harder to make sure that we refer these patients to transplant centres and give them mechanical support. And the bottom of the slide shows that in patients who have either um, severe aortic stenosis or a mitral valve regurgitation, they're being offered devices quicker. We're talking about giving AF ablations to patients who are symptomatic, um, who have a tachycardiomyopathy. Um, and we're also working very hard to ensure that patients with heart failure from their oncology diagnosis or treatment are seeing a cardio-oncologist, and that involves amyloid. Next slide. So why does it matter? Why does it matter to us and to you? So we know if you look at this slide, just to orientate yourself on time, which is the x-axis, and y-axis is functional ability. We know that every time a patient with heart failure decompensates, their functional ability reduces. And so we want to get medical therapies on for patients with HEF-REF that will stop decompensations, prevent hospitalizations, make patients feel better, and essentially reduce mortality. Next slide. So this is a summary of the guidelines, which is patients with chronic heart failure get on board either an ACE or an ARNI, a beta blocker, MRA, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. There's also evidence to use, to use loop diuretics if patients have evidence of fluid retention. And I think in the next couple of months, you'll see more and more patients going home on possibly smaller doses of medications, and we are working very hard to uptitrate these patients in the community. Next slide. So I just wanted to talk about practical tips for ACE inhibitors, um, ARBs and ARNIs. And I know that um, you know, maybe actually that we in the, um, in the hospital are starting patients more often than not. So if a patient in the community, we would ask that we check the renal function electrolytes before we start. We double the dose every two weeks. In the hospitals, we set we increase the dose quickly and we have a rapid up titration center for uh, service for some patients. We would want to check blood chemistry one to two weeks after every increase and one to two weeks after the final dose has been achieved. 
we then want to check blood chemistry every four months after this. If the ACE inhibitors are up or ARNIs are withdrawn, you will expect your patient to deteriorate. And so it's really important that if we can continue these medications, we do. If you need any help at any stage with these medications, please do not hesitate to contact us, either, as I said, through the pharmacist, through the nurse, or through the consultant. We're giving these medications to the patients to improve their symptoms, to improve their exercise capacity, and to reduce their risk of heart failure hospitalization and to improve their survival chances. So there are, there are just three specific points I wanted to make about these meds. So a cough. Um, sometimes a cough in these patients can be COPD related as smokers and sometimes they're pulmonary edema. And I apologize because I have pulmonary edema twice on the left hand column because we sometimes, it sometimes gets missed. The medications only need to be stopped if the cough is very troublesome, in which case we would use an ARB or an ARNI, most typically an ARNI if we can. If a patient's hypotensive and asymptomatic, no change is needed, um, but you need to monitor them very carefully because you may have reached the maximum, maximal tolerated dose for that patient. It's quite common, you can reassure patients, and actually most patients feel better within a few months and get used to this. If they're symptomatic, or even if they're asymptomatic, you can consider stopping other vasodilators. If they're not congested, reduce the diuretics. And if you're really struggling, ask for help or sometimes reduce the dose. But typically, um, they're well tolerated. And if you're reducing the dose, go to the dose beforehand, which was well tolerated before, in preference to stopping it. Next slide. So this is a slide to, about creatinine. So you will expect to see a raise in creatinine as the patients are taking these medications. And in fact, we use that commonly to check compliance. It's very useful to have a pre-treatment creatinine. If you are worried about an increase in creatinine and you repeat the use knees and ensure there are no other nephrotoxics on board, reduce the diuretics if there's no evidence of edema, and reduce any other blood pressure medications. We allow an increase of up to 50% or up to 266 U moles per litre. And if the increase is more than that, we would either reduce to the dose that was well tolerated or half. If you need any help specifically about patients, please do go in contact. Similarly with potassium, we expect except potassium up to 5.5. If it's increased more, we'd stop any nephrotoxics, potassium retaining medications or foods, and possibly change the diuretics. And look to stop at over potassium over six and reintroduce at a lower dose. The guidelines are quite clear that at 6.5 millimoles per litre, you need to contact us and refer to hospital for management. Next slide, thank you. On beta blockers, similarly, uh, the contraindications for beta blockers are severe asthma, and actually in most asthmatic patients, we trial them on beta blockers. Critical limb ischemia or second and or third degree heart block without a pacemaker or a known allergy. Be cautious if there's a recent decompensation, if their heart rate is under 60 or if they're congested. And there may be an initial mild deterioration as you introduce beta blockers. Sometimes this needs to be treated with diuretics avoid a sudden cessation and contact us if you have any questions. MRAs, typically we struggle with potassium and creatinine and then pleronone, be careful with CYP3A4 inhibitors. That's something that we sometimes get caught out on. Um, the, I practice this slide and I, managed to do all my slides with under 20 minutes. I'm looking at the time and realizing I'm going to have to stop very quickly. The Cuto Valsartan, also known as Entresto, um, has had fantastic data in our heart failure patients. 20% reduction in death, 21% reduction in hospitalizations. We are using it de novo 
which means instead of starting on the patient on Rabin Pro, we're starting it. There are three doses. We typically start a patient on mid dose, which is 49.51, and then not subject to high dose, which is 97.103. If there are concerns, we would start at a lower dose. Um, contraindications, history of angioedema, bilateral renal artery stenosis or pregnancy or known allergy. The paradigm trial included people with a systolic blood pressure of over 95 millimeters of mercury, and we use that as a decide as whether it's appropriate therapy and patients need a washout of at least 36 hours if patients are being changed from Ramipril to Entresto. And we would do that through our specific Entresto initiation clinics. So we wouldn't necessarily be asking you to do that. A GP friend of mine did say actually recently that due to coding, there was a problem where patients are either coded as ACE or ARBs. And just be careful that these patients aren't on the cubital valsartan and, and an ACE as well. They should not be taking the ACE in addition, or obviously they should not be taking the ARB in addition. So cubital valsartan is the treatment, so it's one or the other. Um, I'm not going to say very much about SGLT2 inhibitors because Andy is going to talk about them um, in a bit more detail. And essentially, this slide just shows massive improvement um, with them, which is why we're now introducing them much earlier. And the next slide is just a few um, management factors, which I think will be included in the talk. And this slide is going to be shared, so um, you can have it at the end of the talk. I am going to stop. Actually, can we just go on to one more slide? I want to show not the outcome data here. Um, I was trying to think about what you'd need to know from um, a GP side, you know, what things cause alarm. And one of the things that causes massive alarm for us is when patients come into hospital with heart failure and leave hospital very quickly. Um, and a slug of fruzomide is not sufficient um, treatment for heart failure. And if you notice your patients either having multiple admissions or very short admissions, you know, please do raise it with the heart failure team because this patient likely needs to be seen, assessed, and kind of um, we need to get our nurses and pharmacists involved so we can up titrate their medications. So um, Andrea, could you go to my last slide? Apologies. This is um, this demonstrates that the drugs really work um, here. Uh, Heart failure is really tricky. Um, it's increasingly common. If you are concerned, check the NT and the refer. We will organise the echo. Our patients are getting older with more comorbidities because we're allowing you know our, all our therapies are making them survive longer. And in the next five to ten years, I think we'll have more joint working with our GP practice colleagues. Thank you. Oh, Sally Ann, thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. Really, really interesting. Um, we've actually got a couple of minutes for questions. Has anyone got anything they would like to raise or, or drop it into the chat? That was clearly extremely comprehensive, Jess, so you've covered everything that people wanted to ask. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that we carry on then, um, and if anyone's got any questions, I know that either Andy or, or um, Dan will be able to pick up any questions um, as well, so I know that you've got to go, Jess. So thank you very know. much. Thank you um, so much, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do is hand over to Andy, who, and Andy, just remind me, are we going to show your video or are you going to do your talk live? Sorry, I was just muted there. Yeah, it would probably be best to show the video just because I was able to record it at, the, at a time when my son was asleep and now with his nursery closed, um, rather than me sort of try and go through it and be interrupted, at least it would certainly kind of fit well within the time. So I think if we play the video and then I'll be able to answer questions afterwards and I'll be reading the chat as the video is playing. So, so hopefully I can be on top of any questions. Okay. I'll uh, let me know if you have any trouble launching the um, video because I, I could try and launch it from from my side if if you're having issues. We practiced this earlier, so it should work. Sorry, one second. We just have to add the audio. I just want to make sure we've got the audio with it.
Sorry about that. One, one moment, I'm so sorry. We're back, we're live. Sorry about that, just somehow it closed. There we go. So thank you for inviting me to give this talk on SGLT2 inhibitors, which I've entitled Statins of the 21st Century. I've taken this uh, title from Eugene Brownwald, an eminent American cardiologist who wrote the textbook on cardiovascular disease. And over the course of this talk, I hope to explain why one should be so excited about this new class of medications. So SGLT2 inhibitors, are they diabetes drugs? Well, actually, interestingly, their history arises from quite a scandal with rosiglitazone, where the approval for rosiglitazone was based on the Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Association stipulating that safety data needed to be recorded and needed to be shared um, in order to know that there wasn't problems with this medication. Unfortunately, it showed a signal that there was an increase in heart failure hospitalisation and cardiovascular events and this data wasn't disclosed, leading to a fraud lawsuit brought around and, and requiring settlement with GlaxoSmithKline for $3 billion. Thereafter, both the FDA and the EMA have been far more stringent that any new diabetic medication coming to market and being exposed to patients must have rigorous prospective safety data for cardiovascular endpoints and also registry data to prove uh, that it is safe. So what we know about the diabetes trials relating to SGLT2 inhibitor use is that it does reduce HbA1c by about 0.6% or in new money 6.5 millimoles per mole. But there's a low incidence of hypoglycemia, which is reassuring, and the glucose lowering effect is proportional to the starting blood glucose. And interestingly, that's a pattern with a few other changes that SGLT2 inhibitors seem to make. So for example, blood pressure, that's also the case. The blood pressure lowering effect is proportional to how high the blood pressure is. The same is true of weight loss. Weight loss experience with this medication can be up to three kilograms. Unfortunately, that's not due to a reduction in appetite or a change in bowel habit. Uh, this does seem to be related to the effect of the medication on visceral fat reduction. However, the effect of glucose reduction does diminish when the EGFR falls below 45. That's not to say that other benefits of SGLT2s for the cardiovascular system and the renal system aren't maintained at lower EGFRs. So overall, yes, it is a diabetes drug. And some of you in the audience, I may be preaching to the converted, um, but you've been using this a lot longer than I have, where I use it for heart failure, you've been using it for diabetes and perhaps uh, have some experience that you could share in the question and answer session. But it's not that great at lowering glucose levels. It is safe and it's associated with weight loss, which is an advantage in diabetic medications. But interestingly, these early trials demonstrate that it's much better at cardiovascular event reduction. So are they cardiovascular and heart failure drugs? Well, I'm here to convince you that they absolutely are, and certainly I use them regularly in my practice. So when we look at the studies of diabetic patients who have varying degrees of cardiovascular risk, but not specifically a heart failure population, uh, most of the endpoints I'm presenting to you here in these two figures are a combined primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction and stroke in the majority of cases and another secondary endpoint of heart failure hospitalisation, we can see relatively consistent relative risk reductions of 14% to 17% lowering of that primary composite outcome and a quite a consistent 30% reduction in heart failure hospitalisation. As I put in brackets there, some of the studies actually for a primary endpoint or the secondary endpoint of cardiovascular death alone show a statistically significant reduction, but not all. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting to see that some, you know, their, their primary endpoint was a composite of heart failure, hospitalisation and death, but remarkably similar stories that they tell. 
Now looking at studies specifically in heart failure patients and starting off with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, so ejection fractions less than 40%, there are two trials there, both when you look at their composite endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalisation are remarkably similar by reducing uh, those incidents by about a quarter. Um, but again, in both circumstances, the reduction is mainly in heart failure hospitalisation by 30% and dapagliflozin and DAPRHF showing actually a, a secondary endpoint mortality reduction uh, by 17%. That's death from any cause, which is quite exciting, but again, not necessarily shared um, I across all studies. Now, quite excitingly, in the field of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, so an ejection fraction greater than 40%, um, we're seeing for the first time a trial hit its primary endpoint, uh, which in Emperor Preserved was empaglifosin reducing this composite endpoint by 21%, and mostly driven by a reduction in heart failure hospitalisation by 30%. Again, not achieving a secondary endpoint of cardiovascular mortality reduction to statistical significance, but still very exciting that there's a, a well-tolerated drug for the treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that can save huge economic costs. So absolutely, this is a cardiovascular drug. And interestingly, both for the prevention of important cardiovascular events and prevention of heart failure, it will do that in a diabetic population. But for those who already have heart failure, either heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction, it is powerful at reducing heart failure hospitalization. Maybe even more impressively has a mortality benefit in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And so are SGLT2's kidney drugs as well? Well, remarkably, these graphics tell a similar story, the top two being from heart failure trials um, with SGLT2 inhibitors and the bottom one being a dedicated dapagliflozin CKD trial. And you can see what's common in all of these trials is that in the first two to four weeks, there is a small drop in EGFR in the order of about four mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared. Now, interestingly, that is not a sign of an acute kidney injury or deterioration in kidney function. It is actually how the medication works in changing renal physiology. So it causes a reduction in the afferent arteriolar um, perfusion by vasoconstriction, and it dilates the efferent uh, renal artery. Uh, and this reduces glomerular filtration pressure, which overall and long-term is of benefit to the kidney and reduces proteinuria. But in the short term, it's reducing filtration and therefore resulting in a drop in EGFR and a rise in creatinine that's not a sign of kidney damage or not a sign of kidney injury. So DAPA CKD took over 4,000 proteinuric CKD patients, some of whom were diabetic and some of whom were not, and looked at a kidney endpoint of a 50% drop in EGFR, patients requiring dialysis or renal death and found a reduction of 44% in relative risk. It had cardiovascular endpoints that it looked at in terms of heart failure hospitalisation and cardiovascular death. Again, an impressive near 30% reduction in those endpoints. Overall, a 31% reduction in all-cause mortality. Very impressive. And reduces hyperkalemia, which for me as a, a heart failure physician prescribing a lot of drugs that can push up the potassium, that's very reassuring to know I can counteract that to some degree. So absolutely, yes. And it may even be the most significant new CKD treatment in decades since ACE inhibitors. And at the moment, it's not the evidence had not made it into the NICE guidelines as they were written for CKD management. But it has now been approved by UK Kidney uh, association and so should be receiving more licensing approval in the UK for use in CKD patients. So this slide isn't uh, complete, it's already out of date, but it just gives you a sense of how many trials there have been in SGLT2 inhibitors, the size of those trials. Uh, this tells you that there have been different flavours of SGLT2 inhibitor that have already uh, come to clinical trials and, and shown remarkably similar benefit across these groups. Uh, but also looking at the disease condition studies, most of the studies started off in a diabetic population, but the benefit has since branched out to heart failure populations, chronic kidney disease populations, and some populations who have both diabetes and either heart failure or chronic kidney disease. 
So when could SGLT2 inhibitors be a problem for a patient? Well, we don't have a tremendous amount of data for type 1 diabetics. There is an indication in specialist hands for it to be used for glucose lowering. But actually, the reason to, to retain it in specialist hands is this risk that you could make people prone to diabetic ketoacidosis. So that's particularly true of anyone who suffered with that in the past, be they labelled as type 2 diabetes and, and suffering DKA, like a type 1.5 diabetes. Um, and it's important to emphasize the sick day rules uh, that such patients who are in a situation where they're septic in hospital with severe diarrhea and vomiting, severe dehydration, uh, awaiting major surgery, that these medications are best to suspend until that acute Ill injury or that, uh, that acute illness is over to avoid putting the body under additional stress. And then the medications can restart when the patient's back to baseline. Also in diabetic patients who are already well controlled and taking agents like insulin or sulfonylurea, so typically an HbA1c less than 7, it's important to reduce that insulin dose by 10 to 20 percent or sulfonylurea by 25 to 50 percent. Otherwise, there's a risk of encountering hypoglycemia in a well controlled patient. One needs to consider that there is a blood pressure lowering effect, although it's mild, particularly when people start off with low blood pressures. A systolic blood pressure of less than 90 does not give anyone very much room um, to introduce another agent that's, that's potentially going to um, be vasoactive and drop the blood pressure. But generally, these medications are well tolerated, um, even if the blood pressure is, is 100 millimetres of mercury. So common concerns are that, you know, is it safe to use in chronic kidney disease? Fortunately, the latter studies um, looking specifically at chronic kidney disease patients show overwhelming benefit. And there's even safety data down to using these drugs with patients with an EGFR of 20. Um, some experts have even advocated that when you're checking the kidney function after initiating this medication, particularly in the first two to four weeks, you know, perhaps don't <laughs> or, you know, cover your eyes when you look at the result. Don't be inclined to react to a change in EGFR, particularly in the more minor levels, because as I've mentioned, it's not really a reflection of acute kidney injury. Uh, it is a change in physiology that's long term beneficial. Now, as a heart failure physician, it is in my typical nature to, to peak rather than close my eyes. And that's because I'm usually using other medications at the same time that have the ability to affect kidney function and to raise the potassium level. The other is UTIs, uh, which is quite interesting because very few of the SGLT2 studies have shown uh, that there is numerically um, or statistically significantly more bacterial UTIs with the use of an SGLT2 compared to placebo. So the vast majority of trials don't suggest an increase in bacterial UTIs, but that may change with, with more studies and more time. Um, and even then, that doesn't seem to be related to complicated infection. So what should patients be told? Rather than bacterial UTIs, there definitely is a statistically significant and greater risk of mycotic genital thrush infections. I tell my patients usually that's going to be a one off and, and treated with caniston. But if it is recurrent, there are things that may be altered in terms of personal hygiene that will stop these recurrent infections. And otherwise, for some patients, it might result in discontinuing discontinuation of the medication when it severely interferes with quality of life. Patients can expect about one extra trip to the toilet to pass water a day. Um, and actually, some of that mild diuretic effect may allow a reduction in the diuretic dose that, for example, a heart failure patient is taking or lifting of a fluid restriction. And that over a six month period is about one in 10 patients is in that situation. Otherwise, the diuretic dose tends to be the same as, as placebo group. As I've mentioned before, it's important to warn patients about the sick day rules and circumstances, as with ACE inhibitors, when I would want them to uh, temporarily interrupt their treatment uh, until they're, they're back to baseline and safe to take these medications again. Although I'm generally reluctant um, to stop well working heart failure medications unless that there is a strong need. And again, if on insulin or sulfonylureas and blood glucose is well controlled, I advise them that they'll need to monitor their capillary blood glucose more often after a reduction uh, in their therapies. Patients sometimes ask me, why am I going to take another pill? Why, why burden me with yet another treatment? Well, as well as the prognostic benefit, it, there is good evidence that it improves symptoms and quality of life. So at three months, improving the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire by four points, uh, making patients feel better. 
So this is a slide borrowed from the US, but it's also relevant to the UK population. And it really speaks to those populations at risk, those populations who could benefit. Um, and here, for example, I've now changed from dapaglyphosin to empaglyphosin on the basis of the uh, Emperor Preserve trial, saying actually we can double those who will benefit from a heart failure perspective, particularly with a reduction in hosp hospitalisation. Now, interestingly, a lot of the NICE guidelines, and this is where I think perhaps they're slightly behind where they should be, and, and we can watch this space as to how they change. But a lot of these populations, for example, proteinuric CKD patients, type 2 diabetics with multiple cardiovascular risk factors, patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, and are not necessarily regularly seen in secondary care. So to limit the use of medications that can benefit these wide populations to secondary care specialists, rather than educating and encouraging primary care specialists as well, means that the widest population of people who could stand to benefit greatly may be deprived um, because they don't have access to secondary care specialists if they're being well managed in the community. So if you'll indulge me very briefly with a sports metaphor, I'd like you to I'd like to show you this video. So triple plays in baseball are quite rare sort of season changing events. And where else in medicine do you see a drug that benefits three disease states, three organ systems at once and works both on the preventative side of preventing damage and disease, but also works on the side of treating those diseases where patients have diabetes, heart failure, CKD. This is a triple play medication uh, to be really excited about in the practice of, of general medical specialists. So I conclude my talk with that. Thank you very much for your attention and your interest. I leave you with some um, ways to contact me and some key current NICE guideline references about the approved use of these medications in the UK. But um, I hope to join you for the question and answer session so we can discuss uh, any, any of your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for that. And obviously, you are now here in real life to answer any questions. Um, so there's been some there's been some chat or uh, some questions raised in the chat, which Rachel Howiston has very helpfully been answering. Um, but if anyone's got any other another question before we move on to Dan's section, um, please raise it now. I'll just sort of make a very short point that um, I think that the sort of um, issues raised in the chat are, are really germane and pertinent to whenever a new therapy is introduced. There is this sort of slow ripple of proliferation and changing guidelines, some in secondary care, some in community, um, and these often are at odds with each other for a period of time until there's some degree of unification and, and things start to become easier for the prescriber and uh, and easier from a you know safety and monitoring perspective. So we can all brace ourselves for a slightly confusing time with SGLT2s and having multiple probably different guidelines that are being released in our patches or, or you know sort of cross covering different patches. But I think with time this should hopefully even out so that patients get get the widest benefit of these medications. Thank you. Um, Arthur. Hello. Um, the quality of life improvement has that been shown for all the diseases, diabetes, heart failure, and kidney disease. It's a good question. So I've, I've the the sort of data I've quoted is what I've seen in heart failure publications. So I've not specifically looked at quality of life in disease uh, in those studies looking at diabetic patients and uh, yet the sort of CKD trials, some of which are ongoing for empaglyphosin with empa kidney. Now my presumption is there'll be different scores. So the scores I'm familiar with uh, where quality of life is measured in heart failure patients is that one I mentioned the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire and also the Minnesota living with heart failure 
Premier scores. So there are impressive improvements in those. Even when you compare it to use of a Secubitral Valsartan, arguably the quality of life improvement is slightly better, but I can't answer your question directly. I don't know is the measure in those other disease conditions, diabetes and chronic kidney disease, what, what it does for, for an improvement in quality of life in those patients. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm going to do now is, 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 is move us on. Thank you so much, Andy. Really, really interesting. And um, I'll hand over to Dan. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me screen share. So what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes is a quick run through of ECGs. Lots of examples and normally when I do this face to face where we try and make it very interactive, clearly that's very difficult. Plus the talk's normally a bit longer, so there'll be various questions you can have a think about the answers to. Uh, but I'm actually just going to go straight on to the answers as we go through. So first question, do we know who this man is? And of course he is Eintervin. Anyone a Nobel Prize for making the first ECG machine in 1924? And this was it. Could you imagine trying to get one of those into your general practice uh, buildings? Or indeed, if we were trying to have a load of these in a hospital, it's a whole project in itself. And you think what you now, now you can do an ECG just on, on a watch. It's amazing how technology has changed in 100 years. So in contemporary practice, Basics, uh, I won't dwell on this. We obviously have P-Wave for atrial depolarization. We have a QRS for the ventricular depolarization and a T-Wave for ventricular repolarization. And we have various intervals that you need to remember when you're looking at an ECG. So the PR interval really up to about 180 to 200 milliseconds is normal. QRS should be narrow, less than three small squares. QTC should be less than 450 in men uh, and less than 470 in women. And the rule of thumb I tend to use for the QT interval to see whether it's prolonged. If you look at an RR interval here and drop a line halfway down it, the, the T wave should end before that line. So here the QT interval is normal, that T wave has ended some way before that. So as a rule of thumb, that T wave should end before that line. Here's prolongation. So here's the line between the RR intervals, drop it down halfway. You can see the T wave still got some way to go uh, before, uh, before finishing here. That is a prolonged QT. This is how I go through a 12 lead ECG. Uh, you're all welcome to take a copy of this talk if you want it. You don't have to do it this way. Make sure it's the right patient. Once or twice a year, you'll have a clinical incident, particularly in A&E, uh, where lots of ECGs are being done, where someone's done the wrong thing based on an ECG that didn't belong to the patient you thought it belonged to. So is it the right patient? Um, What's the heart rate? The machine will generally tell you, and it's usually pretty good and reliable for that. We'll come on to some of the challenges and what the machine tells you in a bit. Have the leads been put on correctly? So if you've got a upside down T wave and P wave and AVR, probably yes. Whereas if they're upright in AVR, the P wave and the T wave, because AVR is looking at everything backwards, you might wonder if the leads have been put on incorrectly. Um, QRS axis, the machine will often tell you. If the lead, if the QRS is predominantly pointing down in lead two, you're going to be left axis deviated. And if it's predominantly down in lead one, it's right axis. P waves, are they there? Are they associated with a QRS? Best seen in lead two and V1 often. PR interval, QRS, are they big? And duration and amplitude. ST segments, depression or elevation, T waves, inversion, how big are they, and QTC. And if you do those things, you generally would have looked at everything. As I said, um, I will I'm very happily send this talk to anybody who wants to go through that in any more detail in their own time. So normal variants, T wave inversion is normal in lead three, V1 and AVR. Very frequently uh, as a registrar, I used to get calls from A&E saying I've got a patient who's had an ECG for a random reason, usually because they've turned up in the department with something that may or may not be related to the heart uh, and there's T-wave inversion in lead three. And of course, that's just a normal variant on its own potentially. Young patients will often have uh, big QRSs, particularly if they're thin, so you'll get lots of electrical um, 
impulse if you like particularly in the chest lead so on its own that's not necessarily a useful thing to see young people often have first degree av block uh, or even wanky back they have high vagal tone that's just normal uh, in somebody who's young particularly if they're fit you may see right axis deviation in people who are younger and partial right bundle and it's very rare that you'll find that there's actually a problem uh, resulting in these it's usually just normal variant so is this ecg normal And I won't dwell on this, but you see there's pretty impressive T wave inversion. And some pretty impressive ST changes with it. LVH, you need to know about who this belongs to. So if this was somebody like me who keeps fit uh, and is Caucasian, this would be very abnormal. If it belongs to an Olympic athlete uh, who's Afro-Caribbean by background, actually this is potentially a normal ECG. And that's the challenge because we know around about 10% of African-American athletes will have uh, anterior TO inversion. It really can be quite sporting and quite difficult um, from even cardiology's perspective sometimes when you see an ECG like that, but it's potentially normal uh, for somebody uh, coming from that background. So sinus bradycardia, first degree AV block and wanky back, much more common in athletic heart as well. So ethnicity is important. So T wave inversion in the V1 to V3 in patients with Afro, Afro, African-American may just be normal, wouldn't be in me as a Caucasian. So abnormalities. This was uh, when I was uh, middle of the road registrar, I think it was halfway through my reg training. 24 hour tape on a patient was given to me and they said you might want to have a quick look at this the machine thinks it's vf so this is 24 hour tape done at home patients brought it back in <laughs> and it thinks it's vf and you look at this horrible looking recording and you can see why the machine thinks it is vf actually this is torsad de Pointe, and this patient had prolongation of their qt interval and as you'll all know, the most common cause of this is a bit of underlying genetic susceptibility and then various combinations of drugs that will push you then in the right direction. So lots of QT prolonging agents together, of course, even if you don't have a genetic predisposition may be enough uh, to push you over the edge. And as many of you will know, it's antipsychotics, antidepressants often are a big problem uh, with this, particularly if you then add in something like erythromycin. But you need to be careful. So this is my father. Uh, who is a GP, still going age, I think, 72 now in northwest London. And he sent me this. So all that time he invested in my education comes back uh, to be useful for him. So he can ask me for an opinion on this ECG on a patient who's been given clozapine. And the QTC is prolonged at 554. So clearly dad's worried, should he stop the drug? But actually, if you look at the ECG and think about that rule of thumb I gave you, so RR interval here, chop a line halfway down, actually this QTC is normal. My suspicion is the machine's got it wrong because the tracing wasn't so good here and it's just struggled to know what to do with that. So in fact, when dad repeated it and got a nice trace, uh, the machine then thought it was normal as well. So it is just a normal QTC here. So the machine won't always get it right, particularly if what you present to the machine is not a great uh, data set in the first place. Radicardia could be from sinoatrial node disease. So what you'll tend to see in patients who have sinoatrial node disease is their heart rate won't go up very well with exercise. So they'll often tell you, you know, when I'm going up a hill, I'm starting to get tired, perhaps a bit breathless. And then when you do some monitoring, you'll often see sinus arrest. So here you see PQRST, PQRST as you should, and then just nothing. So the sinoatrial node just didn't fire through this uh, period here. Suggests of sinoatrial node disease. And if it's bad enough, that can need pacing. This rhythm is different. Here you see PQRST, 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 and then nothing. But actually, if you look at the PR intervals, they just gradually elongate and prolong. And then you drop a beat, and this is wanky back. Somebody young, that's potentially normal. Somebody who's my dad's age, not normal. What would you do here, and what's the diagnosis? So this is a rather worrying trace even in hospital and if you look at the rhythm strip here p p be a p wave lost in here somewhere one here here 
this is complete heart block. So the P waves are just running through here and have no, they're just literally doing their own thing. There's complete block at the AV node. So there's no electrical current going through from the atria to the ventricles. The net result of that is the ventricles are pacing themselves. <clears throat> and the concern in this patient is with a broad QRS, that's telling you it's quite a long way down in the Hispokinji system. The net result of that is very slow heart rate. This is very high risk for asystole. This is the sort of thing you really want to get a pacemaker into very quickly. You leave, <coughs> if you leave, <coughs> excuse me, if you leave this patient overnight, uh, it isn't impossible that you'll find them dead in the morning. So there's various things you can try and do to try and avoid that. But in the end, in reality, you want either a permanent or temporary pacemaker in a patient like this. That's a horrible looking ECG uh, with complete heart block. So that's the slow stuff. What about the fast stuff? Superventricular tachycardias, which is a term I don't really like. I often think it's sort of a bit like saying someone's got cancer, which sort of in effect mean something but actually of course there's a world of difference between lymphoma and pancreatic cancer and supraventricular tachycardia is a very broad term that might encompass all of these things atrial fibrillation flutter atrial tach sinus tach av reentrant tachycardia and av node reentrant tachycardia af is usually straightforward on a rhythm strip down here the qrs will be irregularly spaced apart and you'll struggle to see p waves Sometimes you look at a trace like this, you look at V1, you know, oh, is that a P wave? It doesn't really see it, you don't really see it here. Sometimes when you go into AF and it's reasonably new, the AF is more coarse and you think you can see P waves, but the irregularity gives it away and the fact that P waves all almost sort of have differing morphology. So these are not P waves, just a, it's just a very coarse baseline. So this is atrial fibrillation. This one, of course, is atrial flutter. Here you have a classical sore tooth appearance in atrial flutter, and typically flutter will be regular. So rather than fibrillation, which is irregular, here you see regularity in the space between the QRSs, but the sore tooth appearance often seen best in lead two, again, sometimes in uh, V1. This is what we more classically mean by SVT. So here it's just fast. You can see here the rate is very quick. It really see, it looks very regular <clears throat> and there's not really any clues as to what the problem is. You don't see flutter waves with this. And this will be a re-entrant tachycardia. And I apologize, my drawing is about as good as my seven year olds, but classically here's the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. So typically you have your sinoatrial node, your impulse to the AV node, and then impulses down the Hispokinji system. In AV reentrant tachycardia, you have some sort of reentrant circuit, or might be between the right atrium and right ventricle, or might be between the left atrium and left ventricle. I've chosen here to put it between the RV and the RA. And current conducts backwards through this and then goes round in a circle. And the reason why adenosine will fix this problem is because, in effect, it blocks here and therefore short circuits this, and then hopefully the sinoatrial node will come back in. As many of you will know, you can also try and short circuit this by doing vagal maneuvers, trying to get the patient to blow the end off a syringe. 60 years ago, you could dunk their head in ice cold water. Uh, that will set up a massive vagal response that might shut this off. <coughs> so there's a whole load of things that might turn on your vagal stimulation to your AV node that may stop this or carotid sinus massage. You can try as well, but in the end, adenosine is a very potent way of short circuiting this. So it might be like that, or it might be actually in the AV node itself. This is all important later on, because if you're going to debate an ablation, it's much safer to ablate this than it is to ablate this, although the risk of ablating this is still very low. The problem with ablating this is if you're very unlucky and you ablate too much, you will result in complete heart block and the patient needs a pacemaker for a problem that originally was never going to be life threatening. So from our perspective, this is safer to ablate than this, although this is very safe to ablate in reality anyway, the risk of problems is low. But that then leads on to what syndrome is this? And what you're seeing here is Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. You see the sort of slurred upstroke here, the delta wave and the short PR interval. And what you're seeing in this that is different to the reentrant tachycardia is here you have an accessory pathway exactly the same. With the um, reentrant tachycardia, that conducts backwards. With Wall Parkinson White, it conducts forward. It is possible it could also conduct backwards. So sometimes Wall Parkinson White patients do this and also do this. But in Wall Parkinson White, it will conduct forward. 
Of course, you could have a normal ECG with Wolf Parkinson White because it's a lottery as to whether this electrical impulse might go through the AV node, then you'll have a normal QRS, or goes down the accessory pathway. But that is what's happening in Wolf Parkinson White. There's an accessory pathway that conducts forward, either here or could be on the other side. It could be on the uh, left atrium, left ventricle side. So that's the fast stuff. Ectopics. So it could be atrial, so which they'll look narrow. Um, and if you have lots of them, it suggests you're going to be run into AF at some point or ventricular where they'll look broad and they may be monomorphic where they all look the same or polymorphic where they look different. So here's a ectopic. You see it looks very different to what you've seen previously on this on this uh, ECG. And that's followed by a completely different ectopic. So this has come from two completely different places in the ventricle. They can be random. Uh, or they can appear in patterns. So here you've got a normal QRS ectopic, normal ectopic. We call that by Gemini. If there were two normals, then an ectopic repeatedly, that's trigemini. If you're unlucky, they might occur in runs. That's non sustained ventricular tachycardia. We will often see small numbers of ectopics on normal Holter monitoring. It's not very exciting. It's just part of the normal spectrum. In fact, it's unusual to see none at all, uh, I would say. Some people notice them, so they can cause symptoms because people notice them, not necessarily because they're having lots of them. They may just notice them. Uh, and treatment for that is generally just reassurance. If you have shed loads, it can cause heart failure. So in fact, the last MRI scan I reported this morning was a patient who had left ventricular systolic impairment with lots of ectopics, about 20% uh, ectopic burden. And once you go over sort of 20%, definitely can cause heart failure. In fact, sort of start to worry about it over 10 to 15%. So this patient was at 20%. We got rid of the ectopics and now his heart function is actually normal. And uh, that was the scan uh, report from earlier today. You having shed loads, it can precipitate VT potentially, although that's not common, but it can happen. In terms of what to do about this, again, I can send this to you if you want to go through it at your leisure. But in essence, if you're not having that many of them, it's unlikely you're going to find much wrong with the patient. And in the end, you're going to probably want to try and manage it conservatively. You may end up wanting to beta block if patients have a lot of symptoms, but you desperately want to try and get away if there are not very many with conservative management. If you've got shed loads of them, frequent ectopics, so 10 to 20% of the total QRS uh, complexes are ectopics on a 24 hour tape, then you're more worried. Um, in terms of developing left ventricular systolic uh, dysfunction. And certainly we're very interested in seeing patients in that predicament uh, to try to stop that from happening. So once you get into more than 10 percent, ought to be offered treatment, various different things we could do, even if no symptoms, particularly if there's evidence of LV uh, systolic impairment. And of course, if you see non-sustained VT on the 24 hour tape, then clearly you're going to want to refer to us. This is a paper, which again, I can send you all, uh, that was in Pulse, it was written uh, by a couple of my colleagues at King's that uh, you're welcome to have a look at. Last bit of this is just on left ventricular hypertrophy. So here's a young chap uh, with atypical chest pain. This ECG, see, it meets voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. It's a very, very deep S wave, big R wave here. But there's nothing else to see. And actually, it's just a young, thin, normal guy uh, who's a bit athletic and is just getting big voltages because of that. That is not exciting. So on its own, pure LVH in somebody young is really not an exciting finding. Whereas if you see this, where you, again, you've got big complexes LVH, but here you've got a young patient with a family history of sudden death, now you've got deep T wave inversion going all the way here through from V1, V6, 1, AVL. Also see it in the inferior leads. This is a grossly abnormal ECG. So the LVH in combination with what one might call a strain pattern here, that is worrying. That definitely needs referral. So the pure big complexes in somebody young, not that exciting. Once you start getting ST and T wave changes, much more interesting. Although with the caveat that very fit, particularly Afro-Caribbean, African-American uh, patients may have T-wave inversion through V1 to V3, sometimes a bit beyond as a normal variant. So whistle-stop tour, as I say, normally I would spend a bit more time on all of this and try and go through a little bit more interactively, but I hope it was helpful. Uh, so first thing, always put your ECG into clinical context, make sure it's the right ECG for the right patient, have a way of going through it. 
uh, because that's clearly going to be key to this. And when you're not sure, just ask for help. Uh, we're always happy to have a look at ECGs. I'm always happy to be emailed uh, ECGs. If you want to ask me, I'm delighted. Um, I didn't put it on here uh, just because I deleted uh, the next slide, which was a quick quiz, uh, which we sometimes do if there was time. But uh, my email address is Daniel Sado, all one word, at nhs.net. So if you want the slides, if you want to run any ECGs past me, always delighted. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I'm aware that we're a little bit over, but if anyone's got any pressing questions, I'm sure Dan will be only too happy to answer them. We will be sharing these um, slides and the recording, um, so we'll be sending out a letter or any, an email um, in the next couple of days with, 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 with how you can access all of this information. And we could include your email as well, Dan, if you're happy for please us to do, do that. Please do. Yeah, please do. Yeah, please do. I think if no one's got any questions, I'll just say thank you all very much. It's been really, really interesting. Um, yeah, an excellent um, afternoon and um, look forward to seeing you all again at another one of these in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.